How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? What a beautiful picture that you've got here and in, in front of us for us to kind of look at while we um, get to know you uh, a little bit more, my friend. We're really excited to uh, to have you. Um, for those that um, are not familiar with Icy, she's been following us for 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 quite some time. Some of the the conditions that you have hydrocephalus. You've had several surgeries uh, and complications with those surgeries. Mm -hmm. And you um, have a shunt, um, mostly bed bound. So we can talk a, a little bit about that. But you do have some chronic migraines, depression. I was born in Iran. Um, and I was I lived there first eight, nine years of my life. And I moved to Canada when I was nine or 10 years old. I have uh, both my parents, they live close by to me. Um, and I have three younger siblings, two brothers and a younger. The youngest is a sister. Being a migraine sufferer because of my hydrocephalus, that was always a struggle. Um, having surgeries, um, I had other personal surgeries as well, other than hydrocephalus. That mm -hmm. has always been one of my struggles. Um, when I was born, I had um, a lot of fluid in my head. So my head was fairly large for a newborn. Mm -hmm. And did, at the time it was in Iran, beginning of a war. So the doctors and everything was limited. Mm -hmm. But when I was diagnosed with hydrocephalus as a newborn, I, um, I had my first shunt put in when I was 15 months old. Now, um, fortunately, that shunt did work, was the right shunt, and it lasted until I was seven. Um, and then at seven, the shunt broke. Um, so I ended up being in the hospital a lot. I, at that age, I didn't have the right, like, the correct sense of time. But mm -hmm. I know it was a long time that I was in the hospital. Come on. Hi, beautiful. <laughs> <gasps> oh, this is so awesome you. seeing both of you. We got you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. Oh. Uh. <laughs> I had asked you if um, uh, if you were married. Do you have any kids? I don't. I'm single and no children except my two baby dolls and all my stuffed animals. Hydrocephalus, like the way it was explained to me, um, is when the fluid in your brain does not drain into your body. Um, if someone like you two, uh, then people without hydrocephalus, you guys have mm -hmm. a, um, a little pathway from your brain into your body where the fluid um, that is in your brain, it, you know, goes into your body naturally. Yeah. But there are some of us that were born with hydrocephalus. Some people get hydrocephalus um, at a later age. This is something I learned uh, recently. But for myself, when I was born, I didn't have that pathway from my brain to my body. Um, and so they had to put a tube that, again, it goes from the brain and then it goes from the side of your neck, or some people have it from the back of their neck, and it goes into your body, and fluid is draining. Is that the shunt? Is that what you mean by... Yeah. yeah. The, okay. the shunt is a very tiny, tiny tube. It is very um, light. It easily rips if you pull on it. It is stingier than a, um, a straw. Mm -hmm. um, and then when they put that in your brain and then it goes into your body, that's how the water will, the fluid will go. 
Now, Rick and Sean. So it just goes into the, it just it, gets directed into your bloodstream or something? Or it just... goes into your abdomen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, the thing with the shunt is because it is so fragile, First of all, when you grow, as you grow, like when I had mine put in at 15 months old, as I got older into age of seven, that shunt will, you know, pull and it um, grows out of you. Right. Meaning that you end up like the shunt will come out of your butt, like your abdomen and says, well, I'm not long enough for your height. Right. And, um... Unfortunately, it's not something that they check every couple of months or every year. It's something that you end up showing side effects like severe dizziness, inability to walk, um, you can faint, um, things like that. You get blackouts, some of the things that I have had experience with. Um, and then... You go to the doctor, and then they, they take a CT scan or MRI or X-ray, and they say, oh, your shunt is broken. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes it it is hard to know for them that it is broken because it could be something as simple as there is a hole in the shunt, but none of those X-rays or MRIs will show it. Mm-hmm. And you end up having to suffer for so long, keep going back to them and saying, listen, something's going on, something's going on. So they and are curious to know, because we need to, I feel like overall, our testing better for people. So <clears throat> somebody like you has had it lifelong, who says, I know these symptoms, I know them. So it might not be showing on your scan. So is there a test that might show a little, a little hole in it? No. Disconnect? Nothing. Wow. Okay. Um, it is still as bad as I thought it was just me, but I found out recently by finding a group, right. um, a support group for okay. hydrocephalus. And there are other adults are saying the same thing where we go to the hospital and we're told, oh, it's just stress. Oh, you're just asking for attention. Yeah, um, oh, there's nothing wrong with you, or sorry, like we don't know why you're here. I can't believe that still happening. Oh, oh, I have heard. Oh, I can go on forever with I some of the things I have heard from <laughs> medical professionals. Like it's really bad. Even though you you guys have these diagnoses, yeah, have the hardware for it to survive. Mm. And, and help your body do what's right. That's so interesting that even then, uh, Ice makes a good point that, th that there's just going to be this bite that is totally mm -hmm. scary. Yeah. The, um, and recently when I was in a support, in the support group, there was an 18 year old there and we were all, the rest of us were all over 40, 50. But there was this one 80, 18 years old, she said, at a hospital, I get checked every year. I am scared with transitioning to the adult hospital based on everything you guys are saying. Yeah. And I was, I, my heart just broke for her because that is not going to be the adult hospital like that. You getting checked every year, the doctor <laughs> believing you? No. I literally one time when my shunt broke when I was 19, sorry, 18, Mm -hmm. It got so bad that I fainted in the middle of the street. Oh, so just... In the middle of the traffic. Oh, mm. my word. I, um, I went to the hospital, and the doctor was still telling me it is stress or you're yeah. just, you know, you're just probably faking it. Yeah. But it was... Uh, to go along with what you said about children's hospital versus, you know, when you... Um, I've, you guys know that I've watched a lot of um, chronically ill people for years. And mm -hmm. one uh, popular one, uh, the Fry Life, is she has cystic fibrosis. I think 
just because she she stayed at the children's hospital for years and years just because it was where her doctors were and and yeah she mentions how there's a big difference you know yeah. adult i mean the children's hospital they you know there's rightfully so okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um a lot of uh a lot of love and attention and like what you're saying is true and then somehow that really changes too drastically when you all of a sudden have to go to to a hospital that that accepts everyone every age or mm -hmm. you know but mm. i to say that the what i see saying if for those of you that may not have ever heard that before that is so true it is another problem that you have to deal with mm -hmm. yeah I don't remember what it was like for me. Like, I don't remember getting tested every year. Like, mm -hmm. I could totally be wrong. Um, and I don't remember how they found out at the age of seven that I was, that my son was broken. I just remember coming out of the surgery, so being given to a man with a mask, mm -hmm. the, and then coming out of the surgery and being in pain. And then at age 12, that was when I started having severe migraines. Um, but. And the shunt is, it goes from like a base part of your brain to your mm. app. That's how long it is? Yes. So that's where ours would naturally drain. That's yeah. That mm -hmm. thing that is. Uh, yep, it's very much true. I went through it too when uh transition from peds to adults hospital yeah, pit writer mm -hmm. yeah yeah i know it's right yeah. <laughs> yeah. is correct i mean i know she no knows. it's okay <laughs> oh yeah. well i have a question about though because you were you didn't get your cert your first surgery until you were how old did you say 15 months old okay so sh over a year mm -hmm. do you do your parents tell you about what they experienced? Well, when I was born with, as my grandmother put it, a big head, uh, they they were trying to figure out, like, what is, why is this happening? Why is it, you know, why does she have such a large head? Um, and the doctors at a time, again, I was born in Iran, and this was 42 years ago, and there was a war going on in my country at the time. So it just, it was hard to go back and forth to the hospital and find the right doctors. But my mom said that the first doctor who said it was hydrocephalus, he was like told, no, it's not. Until later on, they did more testing and found out, yes, it is hydrocephalus. Wow. So how I lasted until 15 months old, don't, yeah, I I never heard it. And if I have, I don't remember it. Um, but glad you apparently, don't. go ahead. Uh, no, I'm glad you, you don't. I can't imagine what that pressure mm -hmm. months would have been like. And then I, I want to ask this too, because it's, You've got fluid that's meant to be drained. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that fluid is just not good sitting. And so does that, up, not yeah. just pressure, but does it does it turn into any kind of a poison for your body or your brain? Or Well, no, it, it can put pressure on your brain and that could damage your brain. Yeah. Any pressure in your brain that just put, like, if it's being forced, yeah. you know, it's just, it's not good for the brain. It's. Yeah. It's um or the head. Yeah. Um still with the shunt, there are a lot of pressure in the head and that's why a lot of people with hydrocephalus also deal with migraines and right. dizziness and blackouts and things like that if it's not working properly. Right. You know. But I was lucky that when that, they put it on at fifteen months old and I replaced it again at age of seven in Iran again, that it was the right surgery, it was the right shunt, 
and it lasted me. Yes. Now, when I put it at the age of seven, everyone was surprised that it lasted me until I was 18. That's, yeah. no, I love, um, that's great. Now, mm -hmm. since you were 18, what are we looking at as far as shunt replacements? So I turned 18 and it just happened to be in the middle of the exams. A good excuse for everyone to say, no, it's not a shunt. You're just stressed out about your exams. Yep. You just want to get out of exams. So, yeah. But I ended up getting dizzy a lot. And we can't figure out what it is. I go to the hospital. They take x-rays or CT. I don't remember which. And they said, it's not a shunt. I find that I would, certain food I ate, I would pass out. And it was when I passed out in the middle of the street, light is turning red. I am f trying to, while blacked out, get to the, you know, get to the sidewalk. And I go back to the hospital with my mom who says, I'm not taking her out until you do test here. They've been telling me over and over and over for months that there's nothing. Mm -hmm. They said, fine, instead of us replacing her shunt, we're going to do a test called ICP. And please forgive me, I don't know what that stands for. Fine. But what that is, is like, um, you know, when you get a cold and you do the temperature, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a little device that they, they take you into the surgery room, they make an incision corner of your head, and they push this device into your brain, and they bring you out, and you're connected to this machine that is like your temperature. Wow. wow. And they said it takes 48 hours for them to get the right reading. Um, the normal... If I remember correctly, then please don't quote me on this, but I believe the normal temperature is 25, up to 25. The next day the doctor came in, he was looking at the, the readings. He turned pale. I looked at him and I said, what is, what's the number? And this wasn't not even 12 hours later. Did he not. just looked at me like he did not know how to say it, but he said 75. Uh, and, I, and I remember I was, doubling. I wasn't crying. I wasn't yelling. I just turned my head to the side, just closed my eyes. And they said, we need to do, we need to replace this. Oh, and then they took me in and they took another MRI. And then they said, your shunt has been broken for four years. I was like, oh, so for the past four years that I keep coming and telling you guys, <laughs> my shunt wasn't working properly. So mm -hmm. apparently there was like, there must have been a hole or something on it and I'm struggling and I'm having all these issues. And then all of a sudden now they do this temperature thing and they say, yeah, your son has been broken for four years. I wanted to strangle them. I love it. You are, <laughs> the, I am, the, you're talking. I'm like, oh, thank heaven above that you're still here. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. I'm laughing with relief, but also I see as the best way of just having this very <laughs> When I get frustrated, I get really sarcastic, and a lot of people think that's hilarious. I love how you're like, <laughs> turn my on the side. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm going to let you fix that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It took a lot of tries because it wasn't like from the surgeries, like they went to put the shunt the exact same way that the doctors have done in the past, but the skin in my head, it wasn't taking it. It was saying, no, I don't want to be cut open again. Yeah. Like, put me somewhere else. Yeah. And it took a several try. I was in and out of the hospital for six months. 
um, and then finally they put it, and it worked well until two years ago. And so that was that was twenty good twenty years, yeah. So they well, say the good lifespan of the shunt is about fifteen to twenty years. You had a good run. That's so mm -hmm. cool. yeah, I did. Are we gonna have another good run? I am praying so. Because two years ago, <laughs> I mean, I, I've i been with a malfunctioned shunt for two years now, so. So you're, it's, for a lack of a better way of saying it, you're, it's still tinkering around. You got to tinker around and kind of pay extra attention right now. Not so, that, is that what I'm getting? Oh, uh, two years ago, I started getting those same symptoms of dizziness, yep. not being able to walk. And I thought it was just when we were allowed to work from home. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was COVID. Okay. So for three weeks, I just like, you know what, it's COVID, it's going to go. So I would hold on to furnitures and mm -hmm. um, walls to get to my de work desk. I would do my work with holding one hand on my head and then typing and answering phones with the other hand. And um, after three weeks, I was talking to a client and there was no voice. There was no, and I wasn't seeing anything. It was black. I just felt my way to the phone with my hand and hanged up on that client and sat there for a good 10 minutes until my eyesight came back, and then I was like, that's it. I'm going to the hospital tomorrow. So, so I went in the next day. Right, right. So. I went in the next day. They took CT scan. The nurse came in. After several hours of waiting there, oh, I said the doctor came in and says, sweetheart, your shunt is broken. Why are you telling me my son just broken now when I did an MRI in March. This is me. Yeah. But in March, when you did an MRI, you said there's nothing wrong with your son. Right. So the next day I went, the surgery was right away. I was like, I want to go home. I'm too scared. I don't want to do this by myself. My family were not allowed to be in the hospital, nothing. I was freaking out. Yeah, I bet that was hard. Yeah, it was the first time I had to do a surgery without my family with me. Yeah, that's a it, big deal. Uh, they, yeah. Um, they gave me, they did the surgery the next day. I come out, I'm still dizzy. Three days later, they realized, maybe we should put in a different shunt, like the shunt that is newer. It, it can, we can um, adjust it from outside. Oh, they do that one. Mm -hmm. I come out and I say, I feel like my ribs are broken. He says, no. And I said, well, I'm still dizzy. He said, give yourself three months until, you know, give yourself three months to heal. Fine. They send me home. I am still dizzy. And I feel like my rib is broken. After three months, I go back into the emergency and I say, I'm not healing. I had the emergency doctor come into the room yelling at me, asking me how is it that I did not know my son was not put in the right way. Yeah. I was like, how was I supposed to know? I'm not the one looking at the cameras and the MRIs and the, but I maybe. Is, he's like, touch your neck and tell me if you feel your shunt. And I did. And what? yeah, I know. I, I'm not feeling my shunt, but I thought maybe because I was swollen. No, the shunt is put in the wrong way and it's wrapped around your ribs. Oh my word. I'm like, how do you do that? I don't <laughs> know. You have to talk to your surgeon. All right, what are you yelling at me for? <laughs> like, uh, okay. So the next day, the surgeon comes in and says to me, well, see, the neurosurgeon will only do the brain part. 
And then they walk away and they let the body part be done by a general surgeon. But this so, surgeon decides, I'm going to give it to, yeah, I'm going to let my um, senior resident student do it. Like, like supervised? I have no idea because if he was supervised, how did he manage to wrap a shunt around the rib? Because you, the shunt is supposed to, on your body, the shunt is supposed to be just slightly underneath your skin, and it goes down. And when you touch it, you feel it. Right. <laughs> and I never did feel it. And so how do you push the shunt down, wrap it around the ribs? You know, I, yeah. You know, yeah. I'm not laughing at her. I'm literally, because I'm like, oh. if she's, if anybody's going to come on here and tell a story that's like unbelievable, it's going to be. <laughs> you can laugh all you want like that, because trust me, that is how I do too. Uh, yeah, we have to build. Uh, it's, yeah. I mean, if you don't laugh about it, it's just, <laughs> I'd rather laugh than, you know. Yeah, so, we've yeah. done all that. We are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's not wrapped around your ribs now. Yeah. They did the third surgery. I walked into the surgery. I come out. I cannot sit up straight. Sorry, I cannot sit up. Yeah, I cannot sit up laying down. They're like, okay, the Shonda's again put in the wrong way. Because now you're kind of recognizing Feeling it's it. not just, yeah, now I kind of know when something's really placed wrong. Yeah, so they went in for the fourth time. Now I cannot sit up straight. So they, they at that time, they're like, okay, we cannot keep on doing the surgery. I'm like, well, you guys are doing it the wrong way. They're like, no, we're doing it the right way, but your body's just not accepting it. Yeah, you don't need to tell me we can't keep doing this. By the way, Ellie says hello, I see. Hi. Mm -hmm. Um. So I, I I have a question. I see mm -hmm. you mentioned that when you were a baby, that one of the um, attributes of this was that you had like a larger skull or whatever. Is that something that was just like a temporary thing that kind of gave them insight that there was? Yeah. Some, so it's not something that's part of the longer term story. Mm -mm. No, it's not supposed to. Okay. When the head is large, that means there's a lot of fluid in your head. But it doesn't so once they drain the fluid, do they automatically? I would, I would think. Now some babies just have large heads, you know. Mm. But they do a scan on. Do you think a newborn, or do you know a newborn that they're just mm. kind of, they measure that circumference and they're like that's that's the little larger. They're on the ninetieth percentile. I or, have no idea. Yeah, no. Okay, because that's something I want to look into to see what do you do mm. so that you can. Mm -hmm earlier yeah yeah i mean my mother had to have a c-section because my head was too big it was like no way this big head is yeah. going to come out other than c-section so i mean they knew that before i was on to the ultrasound mm -hmm. uh, but that's just all i know for our baby you know um but um, anyways, so, we'll now you're, 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 is so, ooh, how many shunts are we? We've got, we've got He's the one or four, did you say four? No, yeah, 13 months. Last 15 time, months. Seven until you were 19. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you had that 20 years. And then you've mm -hmm. had kind of four surgeries in this just, just recently. So, in 2020, I had four surgeries, two in May, two in August, and it took a year for me to, they, for them to say, come in for the fifth surgery because you're not healing, you're still dizzy, you're not able to sit up straight, you're not able to sit on a chair. Um, and that's when I said, no, I'm not coming back. I want a second opinion. So they refer me to a doctor who lives in another city from where I am. Mm -hmm. And he pretty much looked at my scan through a Zoom meeting and said, your ventricles are different than those other people with hydrocephalus. 
you require a different shunt than everyone else, and I am the only one in all of this province that can do that surgery and that has the right shunt. And you're just hearing that? Yeah. So that surgeon who originally did my surgery did not have the skills to look at the scan and say, hmm, mm -hmm. this ventricle is different than all the other ones I did a surgery on. Yeah. Wow. So you're learning this at, I mean, in your 42. Family, was <laughs> like a, whoa, hold on. Nobody's yeah. that ever told me that. Uh-huh. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And. It's insane with all your scans. So, you know, with all of this kind of leading up to where you're at right now, what what's the a day in the life like for you then? I have not been able to go to work for the past two, two and a half years. Um, I am, because I'm not able to sit up straight and I'm dizzy a lot, I am in bed um, in a reclined position. Right. I walked into a surgery room. I left the hospital with a walker. Um. You know, I have to sleep on one side because one side of my abdomen is has such a large inf like inflammation that they call fat. They say, oh, it's all fat. I'm like, no, it's not fat. It's <laughs> like this. This is an inflammation. But, you know, on one side, if it was where, where the shunt comes in, maybe. Yeah. So this doctor actually told me that. The shunt was not supposed to go where it, they did. That it was supposed to be under your level um, kidney, and the the valve of the shunt, like the shunts always have valves, is yeah. on top of my head. He's like, it's even written in the books that it's not supposed to be on top of your head. Yeah. Uh, so, do you have plans for another surgery? Are they trying to get you to a certain point? So they did book it for September 2021, but thanks to pandemic, it stopped. And now, finally, last week, they gave me a surgery date for February. There's going to be two surgery dates for February, the week of 21st. Really, I see. If it doesn't get canceled again. We're going we're gonna to pray so hard. Yeah, really. Uh, yeah, that's what I was like. That's after that surgery. I'm going to know if I can make it to Las Vegas or not, but you are. You know, I'm just, Major. yeah. It, doc, doctors say, what is your number one concern? I'm like, I don't care if I'm dizzy for the rest of my life. I just want to be able to sit down and have a meal. And I want to stop right there and have people let that sit with you because this is, this is such a, what she just said is so powerful. And if you just sit with it for a minute, then you really know suffering. When someone says, I don't care if I'm dizzy the rest of my life. Now think mm -hmm. of the, if you've ever been dizzy, think of those moments where, and you're like, oh my word, that was not only unnerving, but that was really uncomfortable. I feel sick to my stomach, mm -hmm. you know, and I can't do anything. I got to lay down now. She and she a thousand percent means that. Um, that means that she has, you know, she has built those muscles and you just got to. But for her to have said that, that is the amount of discomfort yeah, that really. she's had to get used to. Yeah. You're a rock star. I am actually sitting here. I've been in a severe pain for two yeah. days now. I am sitting here sideways. Yeah. To not feel that pain. Yeah. Um, and I but I refuse to go to back to the emergency because <sighs> the last time I was in an emergency, they told me to suck it up. Mm. Emergency is not our best friend a lot. <laughs> mm -mm, no. This is why I mentioned. So, um, uh, Quickly with CRPS, a lot of people, a lot of doctors don't still don't know what the hell that is. Mm, but yeah. there's a, I want to say Ohio. Anyway, just coming from what I've got and reading the articles that that um, you guys 
that have watched lives ha have met Jim. We interviewed him, mm -hmm. the director of CRPS, and he puts things out and I read them and um, they had a big win, a huge win in their state. And I love that the emergency room chose to, to let that be public about them, that they were an emergency room that supported those that are suffering. And it was because uh, one patient fought like hell and for a long time. Now it's what the rest of us are doing, um, but they found success. Now that emergency room we hope is just the beginning mm -hmm. of all emergency rooms, really, because what happens is just like I see saying several times, she has had doctors dismiss her or say something really rude, more than dismissive, it gets abusive. Yeah. Um, and that makes me ill, especially knowing she's on her side right now, trying to have an interview and trying to just keep that pain at a level to where she's, you know, trying to make it through yeah, for the next it, yeah. 15, 20 minutes. Well, I'm still it's insane. And well, she's always here with us. Too. I was just going to say, you know, one of the things that we kind of talk to the people that we interview Thank is you kind of, you, you know, asking them, you know, what your hope is to, to do for others. And, and you're already just still serving regardless of, you know, what you're going through. Her spoonful of sugar is massive. Um, endless. what, what, what are some other things that you hope happen with others as you share your story or as you reach out? What, what would you like to see happen because of you know your body. If you go to the doctor, do not let them bully you. You know your body. You tell them what you're feeling, even if it doesn't make sense. Good. You tell them exactly how you feel and do not let them say it's all in your head. Because to be honest, for the longest time, I did feel like it was all in my head. Mm -hmm. Like after the surgery, when they said your son was broken yeah. from the forehead and it had fallen into the abdomen. I said, oh, so I wasn't faking it. It just came out. I like. I, I was actually surprised at myself that I was not faking it. Mm -hmm. Yes, it may. I have been through that. I see. I know. Mess, mess with your. Where you're like mm -hmm. I, I, and then and then what happens is you shut down and you quiet mm -hmm. yourself, and because you're like I'm not going to go embarrass myself again. I'm very curious about life. A lot of time, I, I'm like, why am I here? What is my purpose? I don't want to be here. Um. I'm tired. Like, after the second surgery, I said to them, just let me die. Oh. Um, I did those. I did those moments. But at the same time, I am like, oh, I'm not missing that life because I want to know everything that's going to happen. Oh, or like, I want to know what's going to, like, what am I going to be like when I was, I'm 50? What am I going to look like when I'm, you know, I'm curious about life. Oh, wow. And I hate sitting still. I'm a social worker. I'm a go-go kind of person. I have <laughs> everything I am today is only because I was told I can't be. I, if, if you tell me, oh, yes, you could do this. I know you can do this. I won't do it. But if you tell me you cannot do this, <laughs> you got something else coming. Yeah, guess what my goal is going to be? Oh, there we are. <laughs> Whatever you just said. Yeah. Oh, Lord. <laughs> well, I'm saying that you're, you're, it, that fueled those goals, and then you pursued those goals, and here you are. Um, not, you know, your life's changed in a lot of ways. But what are some of the, you know, you know, as you're saying that you're, you know, full of life and curious. Um, uh, about life, what are some of the next goals that you have for yourself? You know, this was my first goal for just for the new year during this interview. Oh. I was like, if I can get over the, doing this interview, then I am able to do anything else I want to do. If it wasn't for you two or Shelly and Will, I would have never said, I trust in the Lord. 
it will happen when it happens. He knows when it, you guys brought me closer to, you know, the Lord, and you guys make me not feel so alone. I can tell you what a difference it has made in my life, and I can only imagine what a difference it has made in the lives of all those people who follow you, all those people you have interviewed.